Talk Recorded live. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the call. This is our regularly scheduled Wednesday night call. We are coming back from a uh, break for the uh, Christmas holiday. Hope everyone had a, uh, a great and relaxing time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. And before we uh, turn it over to Christian, I'm going to give our disclaimer. This show is private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or employed for making legal decisions. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show is for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By ex- accessing or reviewing this show, you understand with agreement that, with all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind, for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in the preparation or use of the herein reference, and has no interest in any issue referenced therein, and is not a party to this or any action arising from, and is only acting in an authorized capacity as liaison to communications between the parties. By listening to a call tonight, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. The show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached herein by reference, and a breach of this of a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for admiralty commercial damages of $100 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walter's discretion. Woo! Okay. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christian, and we are going to jump right into our book. If you have it, you can go ahead and grab it. Gilbert Law Summaries on Trust. Go ahead, Christian. You've been unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Matt? Yep. You sound great. All right. So uh, we're picking up again on the Gilbert's Law Summaries book on trusts by Edward C. Halbach, Jr. And we're going to start on page 6 in the beginning there under section C, which is trust distinguished from similar relationships. Now, I've probably read this before, maybe on this call or on some other calls, but anyway, I think it warrants going back over again because, you know, I keep on stressing that we need to be thinking continuously, uh, moment by moment, what kind of relationships we're getting into, whether they be a fiduciary or an agency or debtor-creditor or others, uh, or whether it would be a trust. And I think we have to know how to distinguish these other relationships from a trust, and we want to know what kind of relationships we're forming. And basically, I think that all all these relationships in commerce today are, have to be uh, have to be a trust because of the fact that uh, there is no lawful money, you can't complete a contract because of that, can't give value for consideration. And if that is so, then what are we using? We have these colorable contracts that are really just hiding the truth, which is that everything is really in trust. And we're doing trust when we go to the drug uh, drug store or grocery store, buying anything, uh, buying a car. It's all a trust relationship. And we need to see it for it being a trust and notice how to turn it into a trust and use it to our advantage. And I think it comes in with the basics of understanding the, the uh, characteristics of a trust. So on page 7, starting out on number 1, where it says the characteristics, and it's not terminology that's controlling under Section 27. So in similar arrays of rights and responsibilities, including fiduciary duties and obligations, may be found in a variety of other relationships that are, in varying degrees, somewhat similar to trust, but which lack one or more of the essential elements of a trust. So they, they lack one or more of the essential elements or characteristics of a trust. It is often difficult to ascertain whether the parties involved intended to create a relationship that is recognized in the law as a trust because the use or failure to use terminology is not conclusive of parties' intent. And it says to see generally the restatement of third, section 5. Number two, bailment, section 28, where the owner of a tangible personal property gives possession but not title to another, 
The relationship is one of bailment. If the property owner owners delivers a chattel to another to benefit the owner of a th- or a third party, this may come close to a trust, but it may actually constitute some other form of relationship. Now, under A, the Guide for Distinguishing, Section 29, the court will first attempt to determine whether the owner, that would be the uh, grantor or the bailor, intended to pass title as well as possession. So really it boils down to a trust versus bailment here. So as well as possession and ascertaining whether the recipient is a trustee or a bailee. If the owner's intention is unclear, an important factor is whether the owner purposed in delivering the chattel could have affected uh, could have been affected by a transfer merely of possession. And under B, the principal differences between bailment and trust. Number one, the nature of the property, section 30. A bailment aims only to chattels, although a comparable interest in land might be a leasehold. A trust may exist with respect to real or personal property, whether tangible or intangible. So you can have intangible rights here. They could be, uh, you know, anything you can think of can be an asset or a trust res property. Number two, title. The bailor or the owner retains both legal and equitable title. The bailee merely has a right to possession. In a trust, legal title is in the trustee. The settler does not retain title unless it is an equitable interest retained as a beneficiary or unless she is also serves as a trustee and thereby takes title in her fiduciary capacity a transaction. However, that would obviously raise no bailment question. Let me give an example then. The transferor hands her diamond bracelet to transferee, telling transferee to, quote, give this bracelet to my daughter when she returns from Europe, unquote. If the transferee is a bailey, she merely has a right to possession. The bracelet, the bailer, retains title. If the transferee is a trustee, she has legal title to the bracelet. Now, Section 3, Transfers, uh, Section 32. Lacking title to the chattel, a bailey cannot ordinarily convey title to another. That is, even a sale to a bona fide purchaser would not be cut off, uh, cut off the bailer's interest under common law principles. The UCC changes these rules in certain situations. See sales and lease of good summary. Uh, a wrongful sale of the trust res by the trustee to a bona fide purchaser, however, usually does cut off the equitable interest of the beneficiaries under common law principles. The transfer of Legal title to a bona fide purchaser cuts off latent or hidden equities. Four, income, section 33. Rents, issues, and profits from the trust res belong to the beneficiaries, whereas rents, issues, and profits from bailed chattels ordinarily belong to the bailor. And five, remedies. The rights between bailer and bailey are usually enforceable and enforced at law, although if unique chattels are involved, equitable relief may be appropriate and available. The duties of a trustee are enforced in equity. Now the next relationship would be agency, section 35. An agency often appears very similar to a trust, and the duties and obligations of an agent hold property for a principal are similar to those of a trustee. So the guide for distinguishing in 36, there are, however, various distinctions between an agency relationship with regard to trust and trust relationship, and these distinctions are often are significant as both as possible consequences of the distinction and as possible aids in understanding and identifying which relationship is involved. Number one, title. The trustee has title to the trust property. An agent may not or may or may not hold title on behalf of the principal but holding of title is not an element of an agency as such to control. An agent is, is sub, subject to the control of the principal, but a trustee is not subject to the control of either of the beneficiaries, although they have power to enforce the trust, or the settler as such, although the settler's reservation of powers of revocation, amendment, or direction may give her effective control or some measure of control over the trustee. Three, powers. 
an agent's authority is limited to what is granted by the principal and tends to be quite strictly construed. In addition to powers expressly granted by the terms of instruction, a trustee's power tends to be rather broadly construed, except as limited by the settler or by law. A trustee generally has powers necessary or appropriate to carry out the purposes of the trust and under the modern view, all of the powers of an outright owner. Four, liabilities, section 40 on page 9. An agent acting in, within the scope of the, his authority and who discloses to the agency normally incurs no personal liability. Rather, the principal alone is liable for any contracts or debts thus incurred by the agent. Under the traditional view, the trustee is ordinarily personally liable to third parties for his acts on behalf of the trust, even when acting properly. He cannot subject the beneficiary or settler to these liabilities without their consent or participation, but does have the right of reimbursement or exoneration from the trust estate for liabilities properly incurred. A. Note. This traditional doctrine concerning trust has evolved in the direction of recognizing the trust as an entity with the trustee's liability being not personal but representative of the trust, a view that is reflected in many statutes and encouraged by the third restatements and the UTC section 1010. Five, termination. An agent's power terminates on the death or except in the case of durable power of attorney, incapacity, <clears throat> incapacity of the principal a trustee's power does not depend on the settler's cons uh, competence or survival. An example, uncle delivers 25000 to nephew to disturb the certain of uncle's relatives. Uh, nephew fails to do so prior to uncle's death. If the nephew is only an agent, the 25000 belongs to uncle's estate, and nephew no longer has power to make distribution among the relatives. Uh, state versus x -Rail. Uh, T. A. G. Burses Home Indemnity Company. If a nephew is trustee, the distribution is to be made despite uncle's death. Now the big one, the debtor-creditor relationship in Section 42. A debt difference from a trust in that although the creditors may have a claim against the debtors personally, the creditor has no interest in the specific property of the debtor, at least until judgment or unless the creditor has a security interest in which cases the rights are still quite different from those of a trust beneficiary. A, the guide for distinguishing, section 43. Notwithstanding some obvious distinctions, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether a debt or a trust relationship was intended in a given situation. Well, that's pretty crucial right there. You really can't tell what's going on. And the other night, I was last night I was going over some examples there and that's, that was really the thing I was trying to point out between the three examples. Uh, so if anybody was on the show last night, I wasn't quite bringing it out right. Uh, I lost my train of thought because I figured I was working that out earlier in the afternoon, and by the time I got in the evening into the show, I forgot what, how I was going to bring it out. But, it's, again, it's, it, it's sometimes difficult to tell whether a debt or a trust relationship was intended in a given situation. The crucial distinction is usually whether the parties intended to create a relationship with respect to specific property. And really it's making reference to non-commingled. So I have an example here of the note in a mortgage closing, for example. And they have an example below that. A transfer or hands transferee a bundle of $20 bills totaling $500 and indicates that she wants the money returned at some specific date. If, as is likely, the transferor does not care whether she gives back that particular group of bills, that's specific property right there, specific trust res, or even property directly traceable to them, the arrangement cannot be a trust, but is simply a debt. Thus, transferee can repay transferor any $500 and is free to dispose of the particular bills received. So if we look at that in reverse of that, we're talking about segregated trust funds without commingling it. So segregated trust funds are really special deposit trust funds. Next example, an employer withholds a portion of each employee's pay with the understanding that the employer 
employer is obligated to deposit certain amounts in an employee pension fund, the employer probably has a debt for this amount rather than, hold, is, than holding certain properties in trust as long as the withholding did not involve identifying and setting aside particular dollars. There we go. That, that's segregation again. The expectation would be that the employer is to make a, the deposit at the appropriate time for any funds available. So compare when a party is obligated to hold for the benefit of another specific funds received from a third party, the result would usually be that the funds constitute property held in trust. They give a case here, and it says the agreement to pay half of funds received from certain ship sales as commission held to be a trust. That was Kramer versus Worldwide Trading Company. Number one, the note. Interest payments denotes debt. If the transferee is obligated to pay interest or some agreed substitute thereof, this is virtually conclusive that the relationship is a debt. And I would put a caveat in there, only if you didn't express it to be a trust. The fact that the interest or the principal is to be paid to a third party is not likely to matter. If, however, the transferee, that would be the trustee, or only promises to pay, that would be the promissory note, whatever interest or income the money earns when deposited in a savings account or invested, the relationship is more likely to be a trust. So why didn't we take and make a special deposit? Well, we didn't know, we didn't understand. But then again, under page uh, 19 of the manual here, it says in section 67 that no party in the trust needs to know or understand they are forming a trust. That would be the grant or trustee or the beneficiary. But that does not negate the fact that a trust has been formed as long as the elements and necessary method of formation are there for a trust to be recognized by the law. It is a trust. So B, the consequences of distinctions between debt and trust. Insolvency. Now think about what we talked about on one of the other shows. We were talking about the Spendthrift Trust. I think it was on page, uh, what was that? Let me find that quick. on page 131 under section 460. And we also want to take into consideration the uh, protective trust and the discretionary trust following forward of that. I think it's uh, 490, 498 and see what's the other one? 490. Discretionary trust is section 490 and protective trust 498 and especially under the protective trust where it was talking about as the beneficiary can be sure of receiving substantial trust benefits only as long as he keeps his debts paid. So back on page 10 under insolvency, section 45 again, if the transferee is merely indebted to transferor and transferee becomes insolvent, transferor would have the same status as any other creditor. If, however, the transferee is trustee of funds received from the transferor, the transferor would claim those funds or trace them into other identifiable assets and thus obtain priority over the other creditors and, in fact, have an exclusive right to the trust property. Two profits. If a debt is involved, any profits realized on transferee's investment of the funds normally belong to the transferee and transferee merely has an obligation to repay the amount owed to transferor, including any agreed interest. On the other hand, if the funds were held in trust, the profits would belong to the beneficiaries and not to the trustee. Three losses. If a relationship between transferee and transferor is a debt, transferee owes the amount in question to the transferor regardless of any losses sustained through an investment or, or theft. If the relationship is a trust, losses from investments or theft merely diminish the trust res, that is, the beneficiaries bear the loss. The transferee is not personally liable as long as he conformed to the appropriate fiduciary standards of care, etc., in managing caring for the property. If the transferee had been negligent as trustee, transferor could hold him liable 
by way of surcharge. If the loss resulted through no fault of transferee, the party who would bear the loss would depend on whether the relationship was one of debt or trust. So now five, equitable charge, next type of relationship. The owner of property may devise it or will or transfer it under inter, uh, vivos to another, subject to an operation to a obligation to a third person. In such a case, the person may or may may be held to take the property subject to an equitable charge or lien. Restatement of the third, fifth on see the comment H. An equitable charge is like a trust, and then an equitable property rights are vested in the beneficiary but it is merely an encumbrance or a lien against the property, whereas the beneficiary's interest in trust property actually involves equitable ownership of property. An example, transferor devises Blackacre to transferee, quote, subject to transferee's paying my debts to friend, unquote. Transferee holds full legal title, subject to an equitable charge in favor of friend. The guide for distinguishing, next section. Whether a transfer results in a trust or an equitable charge ultimately depends on the transferor's intent. And that really, intent, that's the big thing. And, and it's really the intent on a lot of stuff, whether it be debtor-creditor, because even under Section 3-115 for an incomplete instrument, it comes back down to the intent of the party, whether he, it was an incomplete instrument to start out with. So intense, big, in trust, or everything else, really. So whether it's a, a trust or an equitable charge ultimately depends on the transferor's intent. Now, here's the big thing. On the examples that I gave, if I give you my pen, although it's demonstrated by my actions, my manifestation of my actions, that we had a trust, because all the elements are there, but yet I didn't know or understand what what I was doing. So my intent may be questionable because I really didn't know on my part that I was forming a trust, although my actions confirmed that I did. So continuing on, if the transferor intended to impose duties on the transferee to deal with the property for a third person's benefit, a trust is created. But if the transferor's intent was only that the property stand as security for payment, a sum of money to a third person, an equitable charge is created. So really, the whole thing is going to shift on intent. Trust versus equitable charge. Number one, the terminology, phrases such like subject to payment of, unquote, or, quote, upon condition that she pay, unquote, suggest an equitable charge rather than a trust. But they're not conclusive. In other words, it still hinges on intent. The intent is key. Two, parole evidence. Parole evidence concerning the relationship of the parties is admissible to help ascertain the transferor's intent. There is, again, intent. So these people are famous for getting you in an insurance contract for payment, which is your security agreement in a mortgage case, because they're continually creating evidence to support that it's a debtor-credit relationship when all along you never created any evidence to the contrary. You never created any records saying it was a trust. We need to create the evidence or the records which demonstrates the elements and the method of formation so that we can claim the trust and come and prove that it's a trust. Continuing on, number three, other considerations, section 52. In attempting to classify the transaction, it is relevant to consider whether it appears that the transferor contemplated the property could be used by the transferee for her own benefit without an accounting, or that's the duty imposed subject only to the obligation to make an agreed payments. The trustee generally cannot use the property for her own benefit and is subject to an accounting. So that's the trustee's duty. 
An example, the transferor conveys Whiteacre to transferee subject to transferees paying all monies needed for beneficiaries' education. Absent evidence to the contrary, most courts would probably hold that the transferor or intended only that the property stand as security for transferee's obligation to beneficiary, and hence only an equitable charge was created. So compare, if the grant had been made upon condition that the transferee sell the property, invest the proceeds and apply them in their income as indicated, it would probably held to be a trust because then it would appear that the transferee intended to impose upon the transferee the duty to deal with the property, at least in part, for the beneficiary's benefit. Incidentally, unless there is found as a matter of construction that any excessive o any excess over uh, what is provided for beneficiary is to be retained to transferee's personal benefit as an additional beneficiary, the excess would be held upon a resulting trust for the transferee's successor in interest. Next section B, comparison of trust and equitable charge. Title. Beneficiary as a trust is an equitable owner of the property, although legal title is in the trustee. The beneficiary of the equitable charge is not the uh, legal uh, is not the legal owner, legal or equitable, having merely a lien on the property, which is otherwise owned by the transferee. Any surplus thus belongs to the transferee rather than being held upon a resulting trust. Two, subsequent transfers, Section 54. If the holder of title conveys to a bona fide purchaser, this can cut off the equitable charge just as it can cut off the beneficiary's interest in a trust. Note, however, that there is where a deed to real estate is involved, the beneficiary in either case can be protected by proper recording, which serves to put subsequent purchases on notice of the beneficiary's interest. And some liens on a personal property may be recorded under Article 9 of the UCC. Number three, income. The income of a trust belongs either to the income beneficiary or to other beneficiaries, whether they need it or not. The beneficiaries include, including if they be the grantor as beneficiary of resulting trust interest, are the equitable owners. However, a holder of the equitable charge as a lien on a property, including its income, but no rights to income as such. Remedies. As a general rule, neither the trustee of the trust nor the grantee of the property subject to the equitable charge is personally liable for making the payments in question. The beneficiary of a trust enforces his rights to a suit in equity to compel the trustee to perform her duties, but so long as no misfeasance is involved, only the trust property is responsible. The holder of the equitable charge enforces his rights simply by foreclosing his charge or his lien against the property unless the charge expressly or impliedly imposes personal liability on a grantee if he fails to perform. So he could put it in the indenture there that he could be held personally liable if he fails to perform. Number five, fiduciary duties, section 57. There is a fiduciary relationship between trustee and beneficiary. And we could go to one of those other sections where this is really talking about the CCI information. And CCI information would be, let me see, where we got that at? Page 94, which is section 336. Well, here we have the abuse of confidential relationship under 336. So back on page uh, 13 again where the fiduciary duties there is a fiduciary relationship between the trustee and the beneficiary, and that that relationship is really CCI, or really a trust, but not between the holder of an equitable charge and the transferee of the property. This factor may be important in realizing or analyzing dealings between the, the parties. 
Example, whether one owed a duty to the other to disclose material facts concerning value of the property. And I have a little caveat here, validation of the debt, which would produce a certificate of representing unclean hands doctrine generated by the notary if they didn't respond. Now, six, conditional fee, section 58. The condition in a grant for the benefit of the grantor or a third party may at times suggest a trust relationship. For example, a conveyance from father to son upon condition that the son support brother for the rest of the brother's life could conceivably be construed to, one, impose a trust, two, create an equitable charge on the land, and three, or, or three, create a determinable fee or fee subject to the condition subsequent. A, consequences of a distinction, and this really comes down to enforcement here. Whether title is held at a determinable fee or a fee subject to con a condition subsequent, any failure or breach of condition subjects the estate to termination and entitles the transfer or, or his successor in interest to recover the property. A failure of the trust duty, however, entitles the beneficiary to sue in equity to compel the trustee to perform his duties. B, rule of construction. Generally, courts are reluctant to give words of conditions literal effect where forfeitures on failure of the condition would result. Hence, unless the language makes it clear that a condition was intended, the grant will be usually be construed as creating a trust or equitable charge rather than a conditional fee. This is particularly so when a condition is for the benefit of someone rather or other than the grantor and as much as the breach of the condition would give the one intended to benefit no legal or equitable remedy, the property simply reverts, whereas the beneficiary of the trust or equitable charge has equitable remedies. Seven, other relationships. Various other fiduciary relationships may at times appear similar to trust, example, guardianships, receiverships, and positions of ex executors or administrators of estates, even corporate directorships, partnerships, or limited liability companies. So each of these differ from a trust. In some or all of the respects, the nature and the character of title held by the fiduciary, the duties and the powers of the fiduciary, and the remedies available to, for enforcement. Other bodies of law also deal with special uses of trust device, such as real estate investment trust, or REITs, voting trusts, Massachusetts business trusts, and employee benefit trusts, none of which are dealt with specifically in this summary. So a slight view of relationships again, but let's jump back to now on page 9 and focus in on a little more on the debtor-credit relationship on section 42. So as I said earlier, since we have no legal or we have no lawful money, we can't complete a contract. And if we can't complete any contracts, we have no contracts. But yet, contracts is in commerce, and debtor-credit relationships really governs UCC or UCC governs the debtor-credit relationship, and everything under contracts is really sales in Section Two, Article Two, and it's governed by that. So everything in that section under commerce is really, really fiction. It really doesn't exist. But anyway, that's the game we're playing. So welcome to Oz, folks. So we have to do a legal fiction, which is really a constructive trust. And a constructive trust is really a legal fiction. So it's a roundy round. And that's what came in to fill the void of not being able to complete the contracts. So now everything is being construed to be debt or credit or, or debt, and we're using debt to be money in commerce. So that all takes place because none of us knew or understood that a trust was in there filling the void, and it was all about trusts. And we were going to the grocery store and thought we were paying for our groceries, and here we were forming a trust. And we thought we were going and buying our cars, and here we were forming a trust. And we thought we were buying our house, and here we were forming a trust. 
And it's all about trust. So why are we coming back and doing trust business as debt or creditor? Why aren't we doing it under trust relationship, under trust law? So the fact that we didn't express the trust doesn't mean we can't come back in if we suddenly know and understand that we were the grantor granting all this into existence or gifting it, one or the other. Then we could come back in knowing we had the right to modify or revoke that trust and change it around to the way our intent was. But we got our actions uh, that are confirming the wrong intent because we have no counter evidence created, a record created that it really was a trust, and they've been creating all this evidence, claiming interest claiming a security agreement that everything has been a debtor creditor instead of trust. And I keep on coming back to the Black's Law definition under the 8th edition, under the definition trust deposit, or excuse me, trust receipt. And everybody knows that a receipt is a record of a payment. Trust receipts. There's a pre-UCC security device. Pre-UCC. Does that mean before it falls under UCC, maybe? It's a security device? Well, let's put it this way, an insurance policy. An insurance policy for the bank so that if you didn't recognize it to be a trust, that would be their insurance policy to get you under debt because they wanted the note paid. So a trust receipt, a pre-UCC security device now governed by Article 9 of the Code consisting of a receipt stating that the wholesale buyer has possession of the goods for the benefit of the financier. And today there must usually be a security agreement coupled with a filed financing statement. So a security agreement on a UCC-1, a financing statement, is really a trust receipt, a record of a payment, but you never expressed it to be a trust, and their insurance policy came into effect, the security agreement, this UCC filing, then became falls under debt or creditor, and now you're construed to be the debt, uh, the debtor for the next 30 years on a, on a mortgage, on a debt pledge. So the guide for distinguishing whether it's a debt or credit relationship, notwithstanding some obvious distinctions, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether a debt or a trust relationship was intended as a given situation. The critical distinction is usually whether the parties intended to create a relationship with respect to specific property. So they were creating evidence that you intended to your your trust account wouldn't be a trust or trust closing. They're forming the evidence with your signatures, creating records that it's a debtor-credit relationship. And it's paramount that we create the records that's going to be contrary to that so that it can rebut those. Then it comes in with the example of the $20 bills but the 20s weren't asked to be specifically given back, totaling the $500. So there was no special deposit, and there was no truck. And then down in the next section, section one, we're about the note, where it says that the interest payment denotes the debt. If the transferee is obligated to pay interest for some agreed substitute thereof, there is virtually conclusive that it is virtually thus conclusive that the relationship is a debt. But then the caveat in there, only because I didn't express the trust. The fact that the interest of the principal is to be paid to a third party is not likely to matter. If, however, the transferee, the trustee, in other words, only promises to pay whatever interest or income the money earns when deposits in a savings account are invested, 
the relationship is more likely to be a trust. So let's take a piece of paper and split that piece of paper in thirds. And we'll name, label each block there number one, number two, and number three. Now we're talking about a trust that has three scenarios. One, two, and three. Since there are three parties to the trust, there's the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. So there's three entities involved in all three of these blocks. So we're trying to point out here is the relationship to the trust res to the parties and how they change on the intent, the intent of the grantor by expressing the trust or whether or not it was expressed or not. So notice how the examples are going to change positions so to speak, like almost like you take a label off somebody's forehead and stick it on somebody else's forehead, although the entity itself is like still there. They just switched hats. So this number one example, we want to draw three small circles. We want to label one of the circles grantor, and to the right of that, we want to label another circle trustee, and say below that, like in the middle, we want to put another circle there with beneficiary in there. Then we want to draw a line as the example, I'm giving you my pen, and I want it back. So the line from the grantor to the trustee is the, the delivery or the transfer. And at that moment that you deliver or transfer trust res property to the trustee, if it's a now event, that's when the trust forms. So now the trustee is holding the pen. And let's say that I wanted him to give it to this other third party, who's the beneficiary. So we draw an, uh, an arrow from the trustee to the beneficiary, and there's the disbursement. So we have three parties, three separate entities. Now let's jump to the second block. Let's draw a little bigger circle. And let's put in that circle grantor slash beneficiary. So that's one entity containing two parties, although they're one and the same. And then another uh, circle below that, and that's going to be the trustee. And then we draw an arrow from the grantor side of that down to the trustee. And there again is your delivery or your transfer. So I want it back. That's my intent. So then the transfer, uh, the trustee is going to be uh, the arrow on the right side is going to go back up to the beneficiary now. Now I got my pen back from special deposit. Now the third example, next block over, same circle at the top, a little bit bigger, but this one is grantor slash trustee now instead of beneficiary, grantor slash trustee. And then below that, second circle below that, is the beneficiary. So now the grantor transfers within himself trust property, and a trust is formed right then and there. but nobody knows about it. So there has to be a manifested intent of that. And the only way to do that is to declare it somehow, create a record, a declaration that I'm holding this as myself being trustee for the benefit of another party. 
and then you would draw a line down from the trustee side to the beneficiary, and that would be your your gift if I don't want it back. And that could be my intent also. So this whole thing about everybody in the mortgage today really focuses on, on intent. An intent, whether or not it was a gift or whether or not it was, I want it back. If I want it back, it's got to be a trust. If it's a gift, it still could be a trust. But they may construe it to be debt or creditor. So now look how these labels on these entities, how they change, whether or not you want it back or whether it's a gift. Look how they change. Just think about that. Go through that in your minds and study that a little bit. And see if you can apply that to, say, a mortgage situation or you're making a payment at the grocery store or the purchase of a car or anything that you're doing that you think you're doing under a a contract. And think about how your elements are coming into play to form the trust. Which is on page 18. And also the methods of creating the trust on page 78, where we have the elements being intent, purpose, parties, and specific trust res. And the four methods of formation, the declaration, the transfer, the appointment, or the contract. And then what is not in the book is, under UCC, is that under number two, the transfer breaks down to Sub four parts, A, endorsement, B, delivery, and C, assignment on a UCC3, and D, an operation of law. So why don't we open it up for some questions now? Hey folks, if you got a question, go ahead and hit uh, star eight on your phone, and I'll see it come up on my screen, and I'll go ahead and unmute you so you can ask Christian a question. First one is uh, D. Michaels. Go ahead, you've been unmuted. Hey Christian, how you doing? Good, good. How about you? Good, good. Uh, one question is that I, I want to find out is especially in regards to uh, how do we get, let's say if there was a prior foreclosure action, now how do we get that promissory note? Now the only thing is that I have been looking for seems like there is a possible remedy, but you do actually have to bond it is under a, a writ of replevin. Even though in a foreclosure action we have demanded for that note to be returned, and I've absolutely gone after uh, City Financial Mortgage. I've been ha- hammering them on everything from discovery to everything else, filing a complaint with the OCC. They have absolutely not responded one bit to me. And what I want to see is how do we get the promissory note back um for the or you know how, how do we get how do we get that back or uh, uh I, you know I really don't care whether or not we get the promissory note back I'm going to have to establish the fact that I gave them a promissory note and it was under trust deposit oh that's they right. don't give it back to me that's going to be proof that they did a conversion I'm going and to actually, under trust for conversion I'm going to come at them under trust Right. It's like the the SNEP case talking about where the CIA was the U.S. and this, you know, 
SNAP had a 15-year contract. They worked there for and they signed contract going in, contract coming out. But to make the whole scenario short, you know, the United States sued SNAP under trust law when they had two valid contracts on a, you know, they could have got it for breach of contract. So I, I think we need to be coming at people for breach of trust. So and actually, you, you actually you really don't want you really don't want the note back. You'd rather get uh, basically all the interest that's earned since it's inception. I don't think they're ever going to get the note back because they securitized the note. They never they can't ever produce the note. They don't have it. It's right. securitized. So, but, but what should we really be going after, and what would be the proper breach process of trust. Or procedure? Breach of trust. So it's just going to be a tort claim then. Yeah, equity, uh, equity, and also, you know, look up your beneficiary's uh, rights or remedies. You know, he has at-law remedies and equity remedies. Then you could also do a commercial also on them. But you're, you're saying that they, they don't come back with the, the note back. Uh, are you certifying that and creating records that they haven't? Oh well, yeah, absolutely. At first, at first I did a petition for discovery. Then I did an amended petition for discovery. Then I did a petition to compel discovery, and now I just filed for a petition of contempt of court. Okay, you know, if you look at this like on a, on a mortgage case, they are on the the public side of the ledger, and they are continually creating records of evidence. They've got your signature on all these documents and stuff to establish their records that you are under a debtor-creditor relationship and you're the debtor. Okay. And yet on our side, on the private side, <coughs> we have virtually nothing there about a trust. All we have is our awareness once we wake up that, hey, there is a trust, but I have no records created to substantiate that claim. There is where we need to start getting busy at. Okay. Because the trust is going to, once you prove that it's a trust, the trustee is presumed to be guilty in a court of equity. Okay, right. You, he's fried already. So I would okay. be focusing on proving trust and learning how to bring trust in as a claim in court. Now I talked okay. about I talked about some enforcement under trust and let's see if I can find the section quick. Okay, on page sixty four of the book under E it says trust purposes. Starting on page sixty five, it was talking about impermissible trust purposes. But I was reading in this, and I'm starting. I'm seeing it backwards now as I'm reading it. it. Talks about occasionally a trust, or more often some provisions therein may be challenged as invalid, as if if it appears that the settler was attempting to accomplish an objective that is illegal. Well, I put it in there. I put it in there. You know, the settler or other parties. Okay. So it requires the commission of a criminal or a tortuous act by the trustee, and I put it in on that, or other parties, or would otherwise be contrary to public policy. So, you know, I got to thinking, the next section here is, is fraud on the creditors. But I thought, you know, how about fraud against the settler and the beneficiaries? So as an example of an invalid trust purpose is where the owner of the property transfers it to another in trust for the transfer or for the purpose of concealing the property to hinder or defraud the transferor's creditors or others again. An illegal seizure. Yeah. So the purpose of the statutory trust really, which is this whole book is talking about statutory trust, is to protect commerce. That's the whole provisions for statutory trust in a statutory public realm. But I'm not talking about statutory trust. I'm really talking about private trust. So the effect on the number one says, in this situation, the trust is regarded as a nullity, and the creditors of the settler may reach the trust may reach the property as if the trust did not exist or set aside the transfer as fraudulent. So there's our first cause of action. 
fraudulent transfer. So compare under a somewhat similar but different principle, a transfer in trust, like other outright transferee, may be a fraudulent conveyance. There's another cause of action. Say that again. Fraudulent conveyance. And we could also get in there, you know, conversion. But So even though it is not otherwise a nullity or illusory, that is, even though it is genuinely for the benefit of the others, example, the settler's family, or let's put others. So if the transfer is not for adequate consideration and the transfer or is or is thereby rendered insolvent, or if the transfer was made with intent, there's that word again, intent, to hinder or defraud the transferee's creditors, and I put in here, or true grantor of the property, So then the next section is, can the settler regain the property? Suppose no creditors materialized or that the transferor was able to force to pay his creditors out of the other funds. Will he be permitted to compel the transferee to return the property? A, some cases hold that he cannot. His purpose may be considered to be so improper that he is not entitled to relief and equity. In other words, unclean hands, it says here. So there's another right. cause of action, unclean hands. And as equity will leave wrongdoers where it finds them. That, there's the, the maximum of equity right there in law. Equity expects you to come in with clean hands. Otherwise, equity will not allow you to do what equity can do. So the express trust will not be enforced and no constructive or resulting trust imposed. Under such a rule, even a dishonest transferee may be allowed to retain the property. And then B, other cases hold that the determinative factor is whether the intended fraud actually succeeded or involves serious moral turpitude. If no one has been hurt, and especially if the offense so, uh, to, uh, to policy, the offense to policy is not serious, the court may order the return of the property to the transfer or to prevent unjust enrichment. There's another cause of action. Unjust enrichment. Next, page 66, distinguish protection from beneficiary's interest. While the settler cannot employ the trust device to avoid his own creditors, he can employ it to shelter the interest from the beneficiary's creditors. See infra 460 through 489. Now, that's talking about the spendthrift of trust, the discretionary trust, and the protective trust. Mm -hmm. So let's back up here. So we've got causes of action on fraudulent transfer. And in fact, really, the banks have an unconscionable contract. They have a, a unfair business practices, an unfair advantage. And under A, tenancy and B, purchase of products and services, and C, insurance claims, and D, debt collection. They have unfair business practices under that. So unfair business practices are really fraud, that's A, B, misrepresentation, and C, unconscionable acts or practices against consumers. Isn't that what they're doing? That's deceptive business practices. Yes. So we have unclean hands, we have unjust enrichment as causes of action, but then the big one, the big one. Under the CCI being the trust under Section 336, see page 94, or in other words, antitrust for a cause of action. Okay. Because these banks are really impeding or monopolizing commerce by a lack of economic competition because you are a disadvantaged person. You don't have a fair advantage they have a monopoly. That's antitrust. Mm -hmm. So a cause of action against the trustee's purpose, see the number two here following forward, which we just read, also see the antitrust, which is anything against the furtherance of commerce or anything that impedes or monopolizes commerce by a lack of economic competition. We can't compete with these banks.
So I would come at them with antitrust and all trust causes of actions. And I think you're going to get to the point that they got such a fear that they can't afford to lose because if you prove trust, they're dead. Right. Because the then, trust then you set a precedent. Prove that he made a payment unless he made a payment. Where's your where's their payment? They don't have one. And they certainly will never produce the note that would be your proof that they commingle the funds and then get them on another antitrust thing. So I think you're probably going to be settling out of court with a private settlement with these people, but I'm not going to settle for anything less than treble damages and maybe even more, as well as getting the house back. Because they're never going to give you the note back, and they want that above all things. Because how many times have they sold that over and generated umpteen times the amounts of the funds? They want that note on their part more than they want that house. Yeah, yeah. I want one billion (laughs) dollars. Well, I think within reasonable means, you know. I you know, know, I know. I'm, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah. No, but actually, there was there was one case that I saw. It was uh, it was a, a, a jury down in Texas against uh, Oshawan Bank. They gave the um, the owners uh, eleven million dollars. How did they come at him? How did they? How did I'm, not, they I'm, I'm not sure, but it was just under like deceptive business practices. Okay. Yeah. I'll 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 send you the I'll send it to you. What I found out on it. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, we have a couple more here, Christian. Uh, first one is Pack Fire. Go ahead, you've been unmuted. Thanks, guys. Hey, Christian, uh, the uh, 91 and the 28, um, when you are, are those filed in the public record um, or are they filed as an attachment to the UCC 3? Uh, how are you using the 91 or in that? What are you trying to prove? Uh, the the uh, the uh, taxes on the uh, from the county taxes from the county tax assessor's office. Uh, oh, you're trying to get the release of the lien, uh, the release from escrow using the nine. Right, right. So, right. Twenty eight is an affidavit to support that. Right. Now, now, one interesting thing, uh, it, 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 it works over in Columbia, South Carolina, but when you get to uh, Augusta, Georgia, the clerk of the court says, well, w- we don't file individual sureties. All right, make them notices. So what, Christian? Make them notices. Make them an affidavit or a notice. They have to file it. Put a cover page on it says affidavit. Put a cover page on it says notice. Notice filing. And they must file notices and affidavits. Okay, gotcha. Appreciate it. My question is, why would you be filing the exact documents? I would be filing notices in the county of the existence of privately held documents. N- never recording the actual documents themselves. They probably sure. wouldn't question that to begin with. Well, were, it, it, were it, you it, filing the actual documents themselves into the county? Well, I I, I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to do that. No, ne- I would never file the substantive rights of the real man in the public. I will always file reflections of them, which are notices. Okay. I'm just going to put enough information in the county recorder to qualify the existence of a record. 
specifically identifying it, and that's all, without any pertinent information. Okay, so I can do that. I can do an affidavit on that straight matter. Uh, but uh, I was uh, particularly, if we have anybody from Columbia, South Carolina, that are that are filing them and getting them through into the public record over there to stop the uh, foreclosure on top for taxes. Um, you know, I picked that up from a friend over there, and uh, that's what they did. And uh, I'm getting ready to uh, tackle my situation with uh, SunTrust Mortgage. So I want to be prepared. Yeah, I think the only way you're going to have to stop it is to come in with a counter-independent action or a counterclaim in the court and then put an injunction against them uh, from proceeding until your counterclaim is heard. Okay. If you don't do that, they're probably going to continue on with it. Okay. It won't stop. Right. Hey, Christian, one last uh, question. I'm trying to go to talk, shoot, and download uh, the um, – the um, the audio, uh, it will be helpful if you can tell us how to do that. Uh, uh, after we finish up here tonight, i like to download it on a CD. Okay, Matt can explain that to you. Yeah. Did you get the um, invite tonight? Are you a member of the Free Americans? Yes. Okay, uh, in, that, in that email at the bottom, uh, it has a link. And if you click on that link, it'll take you right to the Free Americans webpage, and it has all 44 recordings, and you can select the one you want to download from there. So just go back to your the Free Americans announcement for tonight's call, and the link is on there. Okay, 10-4. Appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. That's all. Hey, Christian, before I bring on the next caller, I have a question regarding a declaration of grantor status. Uh-huh. for um, uh, trust that's created. Um, now you and I had discussed this uh, earlier regarding uh, the, the 1003 mortgage application. Now, um, I know of a procedure that uh, has the uh, grantors declaring their grantor status and sending it to the bank uh, and also putting it in the public record. But after hearing what you're saying, it sounds to me like it would be better for them to still create the document but not record the actual document of the public record declaring your grant of status but sending a notice of declaration right. of grant of status. Right. And that therefore not disclosing that private information. For the, the actual parties involved, you know, I can probably send them copies of the original documents. Okay. Not the originals, but the copies of the originals. I mean, that would be due process. But you're saying it's better not to put that particular document into the public record, just put a notice of it. In not the making the actual documents public. Right. You know, if the, me and the bank is a private deal between me and the bank. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that that stays private. So I don't take the actual documents and record them into the county. Once I do that, they're public. Everybody can see them. Right. Now, as soon as I do that, I end up waiving them under evidence rules. Under uh, the, the 501 federal evidence rule, comporting down to Florida, 90.506 and 90.507 of my CCI or my trade secret information. Now, is that reversible or can it be expunged from the public record? Yeah, I think you can go back in there and, and uh, rescind that. Okay. And then come back in with the proper notification. Correct. So I'm only making reference to the uh, in the public the this is actual and constructive notice that a private document exists of such and such a number on such and such a date say uh, and it exists in the private and if any further information you know contact so and so and so you, there just has to be a unique number uh, some way, remember you have a specific identifiable or identified trust res. Okay. So come up with some kind of nomenclature, a number. I like using the registration number, mail, registered mail. Yep. And you could use some kind of sequence, maybe your the date and your uh, uh, initials, you know, some kind of unique identifier. But the fact that you've got an RA number on there, or a registered uh, mail number, once you cancel that, sending that thing to your cancel it, 
that number is registered there forever and never will be given to anybody else. So that right. really is your unique number that you can put on any documentation. Now, what I've done in the past is I've done a UCC1 filing, putting it in a collateral block for the claiming of a sequence of numbers like that, RA, such and such a number, uh, my uh, initials, uh, dash, and then I put numbers 000 through 999. So I've com- claimed, say, 1,000 numbers. Okay. And I can use that as a ledger, like my checkbook, and assign numbers for a thousand different numbers because I claimed them one time on a UCC one. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you. There's a particular uh, RA number to reference a whole sequence of documents with some different numbers, say the dash, uh, my my uh, initials dash. You know, document number one through, as I say, I've got 40 or 50 documents in this whole sequence of setup for one one process. Okay. And then I put that up in the footnotes at the bottom of each document as as I need them, and I just claim them once. So now I've got specific trust res, specifically identifiable. Right, Exactly. Cool. All right. You know, I think um, I think Harold may have a question. Harold, can you hear us? Are you there? Harold. No, no, no question. No, I had got dropped and I had came back in. Oh, you came back. Okay, that's why you were. All right, perfect. All right, next one, Christian, is uh, Blackwater Frog. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Are you out there? Hello, do you hear me? Yep, there you are. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out first, I don't know if anybody else is having this issue, but um, uh, I'm, the, the call's cutting out a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing only bits and pieces of just in the last few moments, really, about the last five minutes it started cutting out a lot. So I just thought I'd put it in there. Um, so hopefully that won't continue. Um, I wanted to, you know, as just uh, continuing my uh, my uh, quest here to understand all this, um, with regard to um, going back to earlier, we were talking, you were talking about Section 230 on page uh, 66. I had an interesting thought in that we were we were talking about an example two where one entity might be the grantor beneficiary, um, and then these. The second entity might be the trust, a trustee. Um, is it conceivable that the if, the if the grantor is the flesh and blood being, could not the beneficiary be the straw man entity? Yeah, yeah, the beneficiary could be the straw man. Yeah. Uh, but keep keep in mind any of these terminologies like by grantor, by trustee, by beneficiary. In the public, they're going to view all those as being some kind of fiction. The right. Fiction thing they see, represented by a real man behind the fiction. Right. So with regard to well, it's just an interesting thought popped in my mind earlier when we talk about distinguished protection of beneficiary's interest, while the settler cannot employ the trust device to avoid his own creditors. So, are not the creditors that we deal with in our commercial lives, are they not the creditors of the straw entity? Well, really, again, you know, it comes back down to, you know, uh, how can a creditor, say, you know, an under debt or creditor, be a creditor anyway if there's really no money? Well, that's an interesting uh, concept, but... Yeah, but let's play the game. To, okay. Yeah, I with regard, but, you know, see where I'm going with regard to 230. While the settler cannot employ the trust device to avoid his own creditors, he can employ it to shelter the interest from the beneficiary's creditors. So if I'm acting as grant or beneficiary, really, flesh man being the grantor, uh, strong entity being the beneficiary, it seems that... Um, that okay, that, but when are you the beneficiary? 
know, you may be the beneficiary appointed, but has it vested yet? If it hasn't vested yet, you're still the grantor. So when would it vest? I can't when the I can trustee distributes the trust property. Otherwise, he's still a potential beneficiary, but not an actual beneficiary. So how could they take the beneficiary, being also the grantor, how could they take his property? He's not beneficiary yet. He's still grantor. Okay, then so how does the grantor become both grantor and beneficiary then? Well, he better put it into trust and get it out of his name then. <laughs> Okay. Um, I know I touched a little bit on this last night, just using it as a, just as a convenient example to try to help understand these varying relationships that we get into as you were... Maybe you make it a little better here before we jump off that. Uh, go to... Uh, let's see, where is that one at? Section uh, 498, Protective Trust on page uh, 140, under the rationale. 140, okay, rationale, yeah. It comes down to where it says the uh, the beneficiary can be sure of receiving, receiving substantial trust benefits as long, as long as he pays his debts. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, that also applies to the creditor also. You know, if you pay your debt, really don't have any worries. Our problem is, you know, here we have the capacity to pay the debt, but yet they're not allowing us because under Section 490 here, back two pages, under the discretionary trust, the discretionary trust is one in which the trustee is given discretion to make or apply or withhold distributions of income or principal. You know, we're under discretionary trust, so to speak, in 1933, where the U.S. bankruptcy trustee is has a discretion to withhold your remedy or distribute your remedy, all for the fact that you haven't paid the original war debt. You're still a debtor, and he's holding it in protection until you make the payment, because if he issues the beneficiary the payment, now the creditors can come and attach the beneficiary's rights, the interest. And he is continually looking out after the benefit of the beneficiary and will never issue you the funds or the payment or the remedy until you take care of your past debt. That's why we don't have remedy today. The original war debt is holding us all up under a protective discretionary trust where the trustee has the right to withhold our remedy. Which explains why they keep creating wars and, and creating more war debt. Yeah, so what I'm saying is if we go back and pay our fair share of the debt, or at least make an effort to pay it, now they're under an obligation to pay it out of the funds of the trust, and when it's paid, release the funds to me. And then I should have the ability to set up my private credit and make any kinds of adjustments and set-offs and issue as much private credit as I want. And then as a grantor, I can put up as much trust res property held in trust as I want for the benefit of the beneficiaries that I set up. So it comes back down to the original thing, holding this whole thing up like a log jam. But the log jam was, you know, way back in 1776 when we didn't pay the war debt. And I forget how much it was, $20 million? Well, that's today that's like peanuts. So let's divide $20 million over by 300 million people and everybody pay their fair share. And let's disperse the funds here held in here. Let's release the log jam. Christian, is there a... Um 
uh, collective thought on this, or did you come up with this uh, unilaterally? You know what I mean? Is there is there a uh, a group that's kind of putting together a, a path or a process of how to accomplish this thought or this idea that you just presented us? Uh, actually, I did it last week on one of the other shows, uh, you know, and we've been talking about it. You know, to, I have been talking about it to a few other people, and yeah. It's coming up with the same kind of process that we did with the deposits into the Treasury, except this time we need to deposit them on the right side because we're on the wrong side because all those deposits were made under the debt side. We need to put it under the uh, the debt side being the public side. We need to put it under the private side. Sure. And the private side is under Anna Escobita Cabral, which I've told everybody, you know, look at the Federal Reserve notes. It's like you're looking at it in a, in a mirror reflecting backwards because if you look at it, there's a black seal and a green seal. Well, the black seal is you're operating in the black, you're operating in the profits. Right. That's where the assets are. And the name under the black seal is Anna Escobedo Cabral, and she is the treasurer of the United States. Where on the other side is your John Snow, Paulson, and Geithner, who is on the liability side, on the public side, and that one is uh, Secretary of Treasury. So we put everything to the Secretary of Treasury, which was on the public debt side, and we need to put it on Anna Escobita Cabral, which is on the private side, where all the assets are. That's one thing. And then our deposits that we make, we need to be making them under special deposits, under trust deposits, which we never did. So we put everything back in on the wrong side, on the debt side, under debt uh, public debt side, under debt or creditor, totally backwards what we should have done, not knowing. So yeah. never, never made a trust deposit. Sounds like you're suggesting that they've crafted a clever um, circumstance that just perpetuates uh, what's going on now. It just keeps continuing. Yes, yeah, something you could never get out of because the original war debt has kept you as a debtor all these years. You never knew it and limited your remedies only to the discretion of the trustee. And he's just going to let a few go through to make it look like you're getting a remedy and keeping you on the debtor-creditor trail, like a dog being lent, led on a, on a bone chase with a scent, or like I liken it to the bull being led around the mountain with a nose ring, or the bullfighter which is us, the bull, chasing the red cape. If we ever got smart enough figuring out it's all trust, instead of this red cape debt or creditor, we could attack the bull, which is trust, and we could win. That bullfighter's got no no chance against a two-ton bull. Well, if you don't mind, just a little, to expand a little bit more on that simple, expo that simple example I was using, last night with regard to you know, autom automotive title. Um, it seems to me that that relationship couldn't be a bailment because where the owner of the tangible property gives possession but not title, when you purchase the vehicle from the dealer, unknowingly you gave the state title. You kept possession and gave the state title. So it seems to me that it couldn't be a bailment arrangement. Right. So make it fit into a trust. You you at least probably have one sub trust and maybe maybe two or more. You might have a trust at the purchase from the dealership and then you may have another trust from the one with the state. It seems like example three fits it because I as a grantor, the state is gaining the benefit of the registration fees of the sales taxes every time that vehicle um, changes possessory or equitable title from one person to another. So it seems like maybe the state's the beneficiary. In the number three example, grants or trustee uh, transferred to the beneficiary and didn't ask for anything back and didn't express what what, he, what his intent was. Does that yeah, make sense? Am I yeah, because express the intent of the yeah the express the trust. I mean, do you agree with it? you seem like the, the automotive titling would be an example three rather than one or two? 
Is that am I following this correctly or on the three little blocks I gave you? Yeah, on the three examples that you were given earlier, uh one being uh grantor transfers rest to trustee and trustee disperses to beneficiary, two being grantor beneficiary is basically one entity, trustee being another entity, transfer going from grantor beneficiary to trustee and then back to grantor beneficiary and in a return of a special deposit, three being a grant or trustee as a single entity making a transfer to beneficiary. It seems like number three would fit what's going on with automotive titling with the states. It could be. I haven't really given it much thought according to automotive. I've given it more thought on to uh, mortgage. Yeah. I'm just using that simple example as just kind of a way to keep hammering it, you know, gaining understanding. So. Okay. Yeah, but the okay. thing about it is you know, the four elements, intent, purpose, and parties. Well, parties, you know, who are the parties? That's exactly what you're talking about. And then specific trust res. Well, specific trust res, that's, the, say, the car. But then form it into a trust. The next thing, if you've got all four elements figured out, then the next thing to go would be the method of formation. When did you have a declaration? When did you have a transfer? When did you have an appointment? When did you have a contract? And remember, contract here is on a future formation of a trust, not on a contract to do with a car sale. Right, right. But then you want to start being able to create the records that's going to prove your trust once you claim it. So you're going to have to have a record of your declaration or a record of your transfer, whether it be endorsement, delivery, or assignment, or operational law, or whatever it is. Start about how you're going to create your records, you know, and, and, and everything that I do, I'm going to have to have two witnesses or more, or two records to prove a fact. And that, that's what I want. I want to be able to claim the trust and be able to prove the trust, and once I've come up with a prima facie case, the trustee is basically dead because a court of equity judges him already guilty, and the only way he can prove himself innocent is if he's got a record of a payment. Now's when you got him in a rock and a hard spot. So that's where the trust basic comes in to set up the, the elements and the method of formation and the records so that I can prove the trust. Well, now, now that I'm having a little bit clearer understanding... Maybe you could expound a little bit on, like, let's just say, a, a, a civil court case. You've got a you've got a collections case. You have a plaintiff suing a defendant for a sum of money based on some supposed contract or some supposed debt owed. How uh, who are the who are the parties here? If we assume that the defendant is a trustee, where how is it a, how is it a trust in that where we know who the parties are. We don't know what the intent is. We're not, we don't, I don't, well, I don't know what the intent or the purpose is. The trust res might, I'm not sure quite what the trust res would be either, except uh, whatever the, the, the substantive amount of money they're suing for might be considered the trust res. How, how yeah, because you... that indictment or charge, that's going to be my trust property and all proceeds therefrom. So that means all bonds that they got attached in the background, they are mine because they were generated off the original signature on the indictment, whether they got it by accommodation or not. Uh, okay, now this is starting to make much better sense. So, so the charge itself would be the res. When they went in and with the summons and or whatever and, and, and file or prior to that, file the case. Yes, turn that case into trust res property. And put it in a special deposit or gift it. You got two scenarios here. You got number two and three. You can intend to do a special deposit under two, or you can intend to give it, gift it under three. So under special deposit, you're going to get it back non commingled. The other way it would be gifted to say a third party, a third another entity which would be separate from yourself as beneficiary. So it depends how you want to play it, whether you want to be grantor beneficiary 
or you want to be grantor by yourself and somebody else be beneficiary. You could do that also. You got to determine that, and then you have to determine whether you want to be a uh, making a special deposit or a gift, and that determines really whether or not you're grant or beneficiary, or you're just grantor, and somebody else is beneficiary. Right. Would, would, it, would I be correct in, in making the assumption that the only time that you would want to to be grant or trustee would be in a mortgage situation? No, there may be other times I might want to be grant or trustee. What would be, uh, just give me one example and then I'll defer to the next person. Uh, an example of when well, if it was beneficial in, to, to be granted if trustee. Wasn't in court, I, didn't, I don't have to be the beneficiary because I probably want to be the trustee because that way I got, I've got control of trust, op, or, uh, trust operations. In any, you're saying in any court case? No, 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 not in, oh. not in court. Not in court? Out of court. Out of court, I would probably want to function as grant or trustee because I'm, I want to be in control of trust trust uh, operations. I want to be able to administer the trust. The only one who's able to administer the trust is a trustee. Right, but it would be it would be a different scenario in an, in an in court situation. You would not want to be grant or trustee. You would be either either grant or or grant or beneficiary. Right, right. I want to be grant or beneficiary in court. Out of court, I want to be grant or trustee. Trying to make a lot more sense. Thanks a lot, Christian. I'll, uh, as I said, I'll, I'll uh, let some, some let another caller take over. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next one is Daybreak. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Hey, Christian. It's JC and C. Good afternoon. Hi, JC. So my question speaks to uh, hearsay rules and federal rules of evidence specifically. Um, my group and I were talking about the uh, the SOI and uh, the declaration of grantor status, and simply having the registered number as a file number and then putting that on the UCC. It seems to me, um, looking at the rules of evidence, that a court, uh, a judge could decline seeing that as hearsay because of the fact that uh, it doesn't give people public notice, just the fact that you tell people there's something in public and they have to contact you for further information. Um, it doesn't give people the ability to rebut those facts as as truth unless you send that to the other party uh, and, and give them a, a three-day right to review and rebut uh, proactively. So it seems like... Yeah, they had the original... You, you might, I would have sent them original documents, yeah. If I didn't, I didn't give him due process on a private deal. Right. But here's the workaround. All that information doesn't go on a public side, so I'm not using it that way. It goes into in chambers. It's all private. And it needs a protective order on it to maintain its privacy or its, its secret, uh, trade secret. Otherwise, you're going to waive it because I can't bring that into public. That's that's commercial confidential commercial information. That's that's trade secret information. If I bring it into public or even by talking about it, I'm waiving it. Did you get a chance to listen to? Uh, let's see, what night was that? Uh, I think it was last Saturday. We went over. Uh, I went over trade secret information. Yes. Well, uh, I understand that's being private. I was just. Um, so let me think about that. If that's going to be the case, you're never going to file in, of course, in the public records. I'm just wondering if um, still to be to be safe, you keep all that in private, and that's your that's your backup. But the second that you end up getting into some kind of public court venue, uh, then you might want to proactively send to the other party, the opposing party, your declaration of grant or status, putting them on notice. Having, sending that by notary presentment, certified and such, so that there's no rebuttal that they didn't have a chance to review that because wouldn't the court, even in private, uh, give the opposing party in chambers a chance to review those documents, or is that all going to be just between you and the judge? You could restrict it for judge's eyes only, yes, uh, for the fact that since I did give him copies of it prior to that, the, uh, the prosecutor and stuff, uh, why would they have to see it again? They already got it. 
Okay, so but but you did send them the actual document, the actual grantor uh, status document, and and the other documents that are held in private. So you did send send that privately, say to the prosecutor or to the opposing okay. party. Yeah, I could have. You know, I could do it like they do to us. They don't right. produce notes, although they'll produce copies of it and let us see the copies. Just like you're doing discovery in reverse, you know. Oh, here, here's a such such a time. You come look at it. You know, I'm specifying. You come look at it. If you don't look at it, well, that was your own fault. I offered. You waived. Okay, that's <clears throat> that's that's sufficient. I was just uh, so that notice is satisfactory, as you discussed, putting that on the UCC and letting them know that there's an RA number if they want to have further contact uh, or information contact you and take it from there. Yeah, the, my, my worry is that any time we bring it into the public, we're going to waive our private information. So I got to, I have to keep that private. I have to keep it secret. I'm going to do that by declaring, declaring it to be secret, confidential commercial information or, or trade secret information, and then it, that requires a protective order. And every time somebody talks about that, I have to object and say, hey, no, you know, we can't talk about this here. The only place we can do that is in chambers. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the second question I had was uh, the language for the Declaration of Independence. I actually am the proud new recipient of a couple certified copies. And before I go marking those things up, do you have any more – can you illuminate on – on how you might do that, you talked about declaring, affirming, accepting, in different capacities. Any language well, you might suggest on, for for that? On, on an allonge. Well, you mark. Well, yeah, of course, on a allonge. Yeah, we don't. We uh, we. Uh, I remember that from the last call. You don't know, mark up your your notes and, and such. But uh, but any specific language that you might want to put on that allonge? Uh, yeah, but uh, I'd have to think about that for a while. while. Okay. Well, let's let's uh, develop that because I know that's a core piece of that, and we want to get that allonge correct for everyone, so we can craft that. Right. Okay. The uh, last last question I had is you were you were talking about um, because we are not expressing this trust properly. You know, we have these occasional sporadic wins. Would you suggest that? Even on all of the uh, A for Bs that people are doing, I know that there is uh, actually, at least on one of the uh, uh, Skype groups, people are talking about some of the A for Bs and bouncing that around. But that's, you know, very sporadic. And uh, because we're not expressing the trust, is that something that uh, that because we have not expressed the trust, we should not expect to see A for Bs working on our behalf in the private? Well, I think that it really doesn't make any difference what method you use, you know, what kind of remedy you go, you come at them with. It's all sporadic. And that really tells me that, hey, we haven't really been going the right direction. And, I, it, and then this spendthrift trust, protected trust, discretionary trust, all fits in perfectly why we don't get a remedy. The fact that nobody gets a remedy in whatever method they use, only sporadic, is telling me, that this spendthrift trust, protected, uh, protectory trust, discretionary trust, that's, that's the reasons why. It's all for the discretion of the trustee. And they're trying to keep us on the same track, but yet not, you know, give us all kinds of wins to keep us from going in the right direction. And I think the right direction is trust. In fact, I don't think so. I know so. I mean, that's, I'm wholehearted on that. Okay, the thank you. Not in debtor creditor relationship as secured party creditor. Uh, the remedies in trust, it's commerce through trust and equity. Knowing who you are is not knowing your secured party creditor. Knowing who you are is knowing who your your grantor. I know this is a bit offline, Christian. Did in the uh in the declaration of grantor beneficiary status, do you see that all the elements that you think should be included were included? No, I think that's uh, – since it wasn't specifically spelled out better, uh, under the modern view, they're construing it into what they want. But really, it comes back down to it really was perfectly expressed. The first two paragraphs, the two lines uh, – you know, let me pull it up here quick. I forget what it says, but – 
if I can remember, it was the talking about the nations, uh, God, God's laws. Uh, that I forget how it is. Let's see if I pull it up quick. And do you think you've been wanting to go into the within the Admiralty language and keep it that way? Uh, I would want to keep it more in the trust, really. Okay. Says the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. And then the next paragraph talks that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or I think the older version says the pursuit of property. So the certain unalienable rights, specifically we're talking about life, liberty, and property, but those are just the particular ones, but we have all unalienable rights. And, you know, unalienable rights, by definition, is those rights that can't be transferred, period. So how can they be construing that, that if they can be transferred, under the modern view? Only because nobody's standing up and saying, hey, you can't do that. So... We could argue that all day and hold up our funds, but no, let's let's pay the war debt, the previous portion of the war debt, our share, and then release the funds to me, and we'll argue this point later on. As part of your declaration of grants or beneficiary status, would you want to make that declaration there that express your intent to make that payment? Yeah, I don't think they're going to honor the intent I want to make the payment until I got the past debt paid. Because they're holding up our usage of, a, of the private credit, our set-offs, and all the uh, debtor-creditor stuff and everything that we've done in the past because the the trustee, U.S. bankruptcy, on the trustee has discretionary powers to withhold. And he's coming up with the excuse, you know, I can't release the funds to the beneficiaries because as soon as I do that, the creditors are going to attack him because now he has the the property. So I can't release the property to him until he gets solvent. And he gets solvent by paying his debt. So here there is all kinds of money to pay the debt held in trust, except now the beneficiary needs to start waking up and saying, hey, I've got plenty of funds to pay the debt. Just tell me what the debt is. I want to pay the debt. And when the debt's paid, then release the balance to me. So there again, it all we're the stumbling block. Our lack of knowledge, our lack of understanding, of really knowing who we are, in this case, we're beneficiaries. Not debtor creditors. Not, not third-party creditors, uh, or secured-party creditors. Does it make any difference whether it's a secure party creditor? Under debtor creditor law, how can you be? You're just a bigger debtor. So if I if I create a lien against somebody, a lien of what? A lien of debt. So how can debt pay a debt? Only through set off. Well, there's discretion to use the set off again through the original trust. Trustees got discretion. Do you advocate doing a, a rescission of signature on all of the other UCC type of documents that are, are out there? Either that or figure out a way to turn them into trust deposits. Now, we could go back and say it wasn't our intent. We did it wrong, and it really was a trust. But trouble is, it was all deposited on the wrong side. 
it was on the wrong side, I'm probably going to have to eliminate them all. I think you're right on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Christian. Uh, next one is a non-member. Uh, go ahead. You've been unmuted. Hi, Christian. Hi. Who's this? Hi. Uh, this is Candy in Colorado. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, one statement and one question. Um, for a previous caller who was taught uh, dealing with automobiles, vehicles, issues that, of that nature, um, I've, I've been doing research for a long time now, and I had an aha moment with regard to not owners but mortgages because I've known of three instances where the, the titles were merged. One with a car, with a certificate of title, sent back to the state, and then with two instances where the deed is handed back to the sheriff or handed it over to the the uh, trustee who is going to perform a sale, and the mortgages were were terminated. So, um, and I knew, you know, for for all this period of time, I never knew why. And when when you explained that the, you know, when when the um, titles are merged, the trust terminates. The F, you know, the cause of it. That was a big aha for me. So that was just my first statement. Um, and the, my question was, um, I know a guy in Canada who was dealing with mortgage issues, and he got a full fleet, by, by the way, um, filed from, from a, a, an attorney's firm up there. And within that, uh, it talked about special drawing rights attached to a mortgage, and so I, I and I've heard you talk about special drawing rights associated with the mortgage. And I'm very, very curious to find out what it is that you might know about that because I think the important involved in that information. Well, the special drawing rights. Remember, there's two kinds. There's private special drawing rights, and there's public special drawing rights. And they're using the the public drawing rights special drawing rights to kind of disguise what's really going on in the background in the, in the private. So, yeah, anything that's really back office banking is done by special drawing rights. Okay, well, it's a form of money or currency or credit or... Yeah, it's your signature. Okay, so it's just another form of money, so to speak. Yeah, as real men and women, real parties, we, we have special drawing rights because we are the sole source of all the credit. We are the grantors. Got it? Yeah, that, that's it, basically. Okay, now, there's so mirrored that special. on the public side in the international venue giving foreign countries special drawing rights because they don't have enough debt they haven't been enslaved enough yet under the debt system. So they're colorably talking about special drawing rights, but you got to remember everything that they're talking about in the public has probably got a mirror image on the private. And the private is where the real thing is that we're talking about because that's the source of everything in the public. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit. Your special drawing right. rights, you're creating a negotiable debt instrument, so uh, a private non-negotiable debt instrument, let's put it that way, by your special drawing rights. It's okay, your is it cleanable rights given to like you by a, God. Okay, it's like a credit account, but how does a nation get special drawing rights of that nature? Full faith and credit word. based on we the people. And who's we the people? The private. Okay. Well, just another way of hiding to correct it. further. Yeah, yeah. they just another layer of words that they use to you know to hide it a little better, so that you got to go down another little rabbit hole to get to the next layer underneath. Okay. 
They just pile layer upon layer upon layer of wordsmithing. You know, like back in the 80s, there was Michael Milliken and his junk bonds. You know what it's called today? It's called securitization. Same thing, different face mask. Different time. Same thing. This popped itself up under a different name, and it still acts the same, still does the same, except we didn't learn back then. We don't learn now. I guess we're, we're a bunch of fools because we keep doing everything that we do uh, the same way we did yesterday, and today we expect different results. <laughs> That's the definition of a fool. Fantasy. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, we got one more here. Central Coastal California. Go ahead, you've been unmuted. I guess that meant to be. Yeah, well, uh, going back to the uh, the revs on the houses and cars. I'm thinking that the houses and cars are not the revs, but it's the titles of the actual only revs, isn't it? Yeah, the colorable titles could be the, the res property, yeah. Because the actual land, for example, we don't have the, the right to transfer that because that's under the original trust from our maker. So uh, essentially, what we're trading in, or they probably have, is our sweat equity. Yeah, which is represented by our signature for the future, yeah. That's why I say okay. that. Our signature is the the actual trust res, you know. It represents all our future labor, all our assets. That's the most va valuable thing that you've got is your signature. And we need to guard that and be giving that out very cautiously how we're putting them on the contracts that we're signing, colorable contracts that we're signing, you know, and making sure that we put down the proper qualifier so that we're not held personally liable and we're not the sureties for the debts. Good. Thank you. Okay, Matt, anybody else? No, that's it, Christian. Oh, you know, I take that back. We do have one more that popped up here. I don't know if I can say it right. Rhonda Ray? Yep. You've been on Hi, Rhonda. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi, Christian. Um, you was talking about our, life, our rights being unalienable, uh, but yet they say we owe a debt. Could it be that they're, it's not us that they're uh, calling a debtor? Could it be our mirror image that they're calling a debtor? Right, because it's operating under a debtor-credit relationship in the public, which is all debt currency operating on a com com uh, commerce. Yeah, so it's the public that, that owes the private, yeah, not the, the other way around. Right. Um, <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence, when we that's going to be a, a special deposit into the private side of the Treasury. Is that correct? Right. Is that in itself, the Declaration of Independence, it is a trust. I mean, it, the Declaration is a trust term. Uh, where is the value in the Declaration of Independence? Okay, if you look at the birth certificate that we've done in the past when we deposited that into the Treasury, what was the value of it? Well, it was really unlimited. Its value was zero. Okay. And only until I put a value, of, of a label on a value on that with my secondary uh, deposits that I made against that, when I put something of a known value, then that made it so they could use a set-off against that value, drawn against that unlimited value. So there was a layer established, one on top of the other. The one in first, the unlimited amount, or the zero amount, and then the second one on top of that, a known amount, and then all other set-offs or adjustments against that. So the same way here. What is it worth? You're the only one who can establish its worth. 
okay, but uh, basically what it's representing is all the private assets. Yeah, but the assets are really unlimited. Uh, tell me how much the assets right. a real man can produce. Uh, but some, like say the the birth certificate, they're they're using that as a security, right? And they're they're making money off that birth certificate, right? Yeah, they're drawing bonds against that and got it invested. Yeah, and they've securitized that. But actually, it really got its value from the private side. Correct. Because everything in the public is fiction anyway. Yeah, they got you to put a signature on a value uh, of something, and that became the value because you put your signature on it. You okay. authorized it. Okay. Now, uh, when we make these deposits, special deposits of the Declaration of Independence, is, say, 300 million people woke up tomorrow <laughs> and uh, realized what was going on. Would 300 million people have to order a certified copy of the Declaration of Independence and make an individual uh, special deposit of that? If that or, woke up, I don't think it would have to have anything. If they just all said, "Hey, we want our money." <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say let's say a few million. But say could instead of say 100 people going and getting a certified copy of the Declaration of Independence, could could one certified copy be had? obtained, and then on the allonge uh, have all maybe 100 signatures, say, similar to a class action lawsuit possibly, where you have all these signers that say, we're all claiming this, uh, we're all making a special deposit of this, of this trust on this Declaration of Independence. Could something like that be done? Yes, but if you've got enough people, it really comes back down to this, uh, whether you have enough people or not. It comes back down to what's my intent. Because I really don't have to have all this documentation. The reason why I have all this documentation is so that in case I need a record, that I can produce the record in the public. If I don't need to produce the record, you know, everything can be established by my word. That is my contract. That is my bond. Mm-hmm. But right. we have to have these records because the public says, you know, we have to have things in writing and all this other stuff. Because they've established their records. Yeah, right. Like, so, he, like he was talking earlier, they've established on record that, you know, they're this and they're that and you're a debtor. Yeah, but they established by your signature on your record that they're using against you. Right, but they made a record of it. Yes. Because we so, created all those records under debtor credit. We signed all those documents making us a debtor. Nobody else signed them but us. Mm -hmm. And just so, because we didn't know it was a trust, uh, if we finally wake up, I can redo my intent, modify the thing, and then do another new manifestation of my intent and create a record of that act or deed that was done. And now, now I can establish the fact and prove the claim. Right. Yeah, I'm I was just that for their benefit. I was just curious if say you had five or ten people, if you could get one certified copy of the declaration, have ten people sign it that they're uh that they're uh, expert that, that was the original uh, seventeen seventy six, the signers uh, how many signers were on there? Fifty six? Right. And then you just send one uh, uh, non-negotiable money order instrument and say, tally up all these uh, <laughs> sure. people's public sure. debt. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. And just make it one chunk. We could go in collectively, yes. And then, and then after that, each individual could, you know, start handling their own business, depositing their own negoti non-negotiable instruments on the private side to take care of their mirror image. Right. It could be done okay. individually or collectively or in groups, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, we sure do, Christian. We have uh, B. Michaels again. I had a comment. Go ahead. Just a quick question. How should we be signing any type of document that would be circulated in commerce? Which would what would be the proper way to sign it? Would it be as authorized agent uh, without recourse, or how how would it be in, entitled for our signature? 
Well, I would sign it very carefully. <laughs> Can you define carefully? <laughs> yeah. Hey, as one of the three primary ones as grantor, trustee, and beneficiary, you know, by grantor, by trustee, by beneficiary. That so the other one, authorized representative, the only way I'm going to sign by authorized representative without it being construed under debt or creditor is if I got a contract between the trustee and myself that that trustee appointed me, you know, say like on Form 56, or the grantor appointed me in a co-trustee position or, uh, you know, as an authorized rep to assist or uh, assist the trustee in some way. Now I can use that under trust instead of, you know, debt or credit, Article 3. Okay, so you would stick to either, well, if it was, if it's on the private side, then you can use trustee. Um, yeah, not in court, probably grant or trustee. If I'm in court, then grant or trustee, or could be authorized rep all the way along. <coughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, because I found is that you really don't want to use the term trustee. <clears throat> I did that in a, in a in a case in in Florida. It was actually, and it's been a, a bogus case for years. But when I basically revocated my trustee position, all in, all enforcement stopped mm-hmm. because that's who they hold accountable. There's always the trustee, which actually falls under corpus jurisdiction four, especially like if you're uh, considered a ward of the court. And that's why when people have attorneys, the attorneys are actually a co-trustee along with you until it comes to the point of sentencing. And then they just switch the burden on to you because they ask you, do you understand the charges brought forth? When you say yes, now you have full knowledge of it. And then that's when they go, here's your bracelet. <laughs> well, that's why I like to sign myself as by grantor slash settler. Well, because if I'm the grantor, then I got the right to appoint a trustee or modify it any way I want. Okay. But you're saying in your signatures then, well, let's say in, in signing your checks, let's say checks, you would sign it like by grantor? Well, yeah, well, I might have some problems with that because uh, I'd have to go back and change my signature card probably, and at that point they make squawk about that. All right. So I would sign that by dot, 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 three dots, and then my signature. And under UCC 3-115, I got an incomplete instrument. That was my intent that later on I'm going to add words or numbers to make it complete. And that words I'm going to add is by grantor. And those three dots are sure. something missing. And that's 315 or 315? Yeah, 3-115 UCC. Oh, 115. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So include the three dots, and then this way it doesn't really draw a red flag. Right. Okay, I understand. Okay. All right, thank you. So, Christian, in that scenario, are you not writing on their all rights reserved without recourse, without prejudice, or UCC 1-207 or UCC 1-308? None of that's going on there? Mm, I don't the have to. It really comes back down to my intent. Again, that's the big thing. Okay. What was the intent? Well, there's some missing is things a, in here. It's an incomplete instrument, and my intent was to add it in later on. So, so literally on the signature line, it's dot dot dot, and then your your autograph. Right. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Nothing after it, nothing before it, nothing above it, nothing below it. Your intent was it's an incomplete instrument, and you want to go back at a later time to write in as grantor or something to that effect. Right. I mean, the three dots. Once I Say that it was missing by grantor. Once I put grantor in there, I got the right to redo everything. Then. <laughs> wow. And like you said, that's not going to raise any red flags to see three dots. I don't think so. No, that's you know, make them nice and small and close together. Three dots in my name, my signature. Wow. Huh. Fascinating. Well, that's all we have for uh, callers with questions, and that's pretty much all we have for time tonight. So uh, if, is there anything else that you want to add or, or wrap up, Christian? Yeah, where we're going to start next week is we're going to go into then the uh, – let me see what page that is. The 
the expression of the trust there. Again, uh, the message of trust creation on page 78. Okay, so page 78? Page 78, yeah. The methods yeah. of trust creation. Beautiful. And then we may, well, you know, think about those three blocks in those diagrams and run them through your head in different scenarios. You know, we may try working that out because that, that needs to be flushed out a little better than what it is. Uh, remember the, the intent. What was your intent? That I wanted it back or that I want to give it a, as a gift? And then test those scenarios in how the labels are formed on the entities and how they switch around, whether it was I want it back or whether I wanted a gift. And then try to apply it in to say what happened in 1933 when we gifted the gold or we gave the gold into trust or in a mortgage situation or like the fellow was talking about with the car. Right. One one comment I have on the car, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Bob Clinton, but yeah. he's got a website, Bob Clinton, I think it's .com or it's .org. Uh, but in there, he talks about, um, in all the states' uh, titles and statutes, the transferee uh, should get the manufacturer's certificate of origin, which is like the birth certificate, uh, if you pay cash for the car. And the reason they give it to the state for registration purposes, is to hold it in trust for the, uh, uh, you know, the bank or whoever has a lien against it. Well, when you signed, when you checked the little box, the T T and L blocks, the tax, title, and license, you gave them power of attorney to do all that. Revoke that, or don't check that block. Right. Don't give them power of attorney to do that. Yeah. What he is saying is, is um, just establish ahead of time that. Uh, if you pay cash for that car that you get the manufacturer's certificate of origin and you don't register it with the state. And if that's the case, then the state does, like you said, if you put something like that into the public, uh, you have just surrendered it. And when you hold the title, um, all you're holding is evidence of the title. You're not holding true title, which means the true owner is the state. And that's yeah, why they can require oh, insurance okay. on it. They can require driver's license. For the driver, they can require a license plate where you have to pay tabs every year. That's why they can pull you over. They can tow your vehicle. But guess what? If you hold that manufacturer's certificate of origin, you own it, and the state has no authority or no right to touch the car or to uh, fine you, especially if you're not driving with the privilege of having a driver's license. Yeah, if you did a, a notice of the sale and just pull that out as certified copy, the certified copy, there's your title. Okay, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Matt? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, with regards to Bob, uh, you might want to know that he uh, he has retired because uh, he was well up in age now. So um, he um, brought everything down. The site is up. It's not up anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, so he's um, he's gone. Oh, well, thank you, Harold, for uh, pointing that out. I appreciate that. Okay, well, uh, thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. Thanks for joining us on the call. We look forward to uh, uh, getting back together again next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, I will be sure to uh, get the call up and, and get the reminder out to everybody. Have a great evening. Have a great weekend. Happy New Year, everybody, and we'll see you all next year. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Harold. Good night, everybody. Harold. Good night.